Associate Professor of Architecture at McGill University. I'd like to start uh, with land acknowledgement. Yes, hiking skills. Yes. So we acknowledge that McGill University is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. This unceded territory is home to the Ganyangahaga Nation, encompassed by the traditional homelands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Anishinaabe Nations. We respect the members of these nations as the traditional custodians and architects of the places we know today. As scholars, students, it's important to recognize the past and ongoing consequences of colonialism across Turtle Island. For example, our university is named for James McGill, who enslaved Black and Indigenous people named Jacques or Jack, Sarah, May Louise, an Indigenous boy whose name is unknown, born in 1768, and Mary Potemian. Today at this event, we encourage each other <laughs> to enhance awareness of indigenous traditions by researching the history of these lands and others we are occupying. This event is co-sponsored by the Research Group on Democracy, Space and Technology of the Jan Pirlin Center and the Peter Guahua Fu School of Architecture. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Kathleen James Chakraborty. Dr. James Chakraborty is a professor of art history at the University of College Dublin. She has previously taught at the University of California, Berkeley, where um, she taught, uh, among other courses, the famous 170B history survey course. And that course later became the basis of her book, Architecture Since 1400, which is widely assigned in global history survey courses in architecture in North America. And I've also assigned that book. In addition to Berkeley, Professor J James Chakraborty has taught at, at the Yale School of Architecture, where she was a Vincent Scully visiting professor in architectural history. In 2019, she received the gold medal in the humanities from the Royal Irish Academy. Her books include German Architecture for a Mass Audience, Modernism as Memory, Building Identity in the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as the edited collections, Bauhaus Culture from Weimar to the Cold War, and India in Art in Ireland. Professor James Chakraborty currently holds a 2021-22 Elsa Mellenbrus Senior Fellowship at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Her current research is funded by a five-year advance grant from the European Research Council. The research explores how women and members of ethnic minorities have shaped modern architecture and design. We are delighted that she will be sharing a fragment of this work with us today. Please join me in welcoming Professor James Chakraborty. Thank you so much, Ipna. It's a real treat to be here. Now, can you see my screen properly? Did yes. the share work? Perfect. Yes. yes. So I'd like to thank, in fact, Raleigh, one of the uh, former graduate student um, assistants on 170 A and B for the invitation to speak to you and to apologize that due to the pandemic, I can't do so in person. And I would like to acknowledge for those of you who may be watching from outside that I delivered parts of this lecture already at a colloquium uh, sponsored by the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery. So um, it's not, it's partly a new talk, but not 100% a new talk. Masculinist histories of modern architecture tell us that in 1932, the international style was introduced to audiences in the United States through a traveling exhibition organized by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was on view there for six weeks and curated by Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson. Putting aside the involvement of Lewis Mumford and Catherine Bauer in organizing a display that featured a great deal of new European housing not included in Hitchcock and Johnson's later book, The International Style, this story is demonstrably false. 
More than 20 years ago, in 1999, Margaret Kenkins Craig made clear the various channels through which news of the Bauhaus had already crossed the Atlantic. Le Cabousier, and for that matter, also Eric Mendelssohn, were also far from unknown in the United States at the time. No one knew better than Hitchcock and Johnson themselves that much of the credit they took was unwarranted and that one of the people with whom it should certainly have been shared was Ethel Power, the editor of House Beautiful. Hitchcock published the work of Le Cabousier there in 1928, as you see on the left, the year before his book, Modern Architecture, Romanticism and Reintegration appeared. He was careful, however, to ally the European work he showed with the ethos of the magazine. Johnson introduced the term international style, which he borrowed from Frederick Kiesler to house beautiful readers in 1921. As exemplars, he illustrated two projects by the firm of Klaus and Dahl, one, a design that pioneering aviator Charles Lindbergh had already rejected, and another that Johnson's mother planned to build, although that never happened either. Both had been featured in a recent exhibition in New York of work that the Architectural League had refused to show. This, the uh, work Salon des Refusés, shall we say, was one of the many exhibitions to which Power, who would completely ignore the later MoMA show, alerted her readers. There are many ways, oops, no, I, there we are, to write architectural history. One focuses almost entirely on male architects, clients, and critics. Another inserts women into the story. Such efforts are not new. Dolores Hayden's book, The Grand Dom uh, Domestic Revolution, appeared already in the 1980s. But more remains to be done not least because so little of this scholarship has been folded into the survey texts and classes through which most potential architects are introduced to the history of the built environment. Although there are other reasons, including sexual harassment and discrimination against mothers that account for the fact that roughly half the women trained in the US, the UK and Ireland over the last 30 years uh, have decided not to pursue careers in the profession. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics for Canada about that, but investigations into their disenchantment repeatedly note complaints that the contributions of women did not feature in their architectural education. But the biggest problem with masculine histories is that they simply aren't true. There's been a welcome explosion in recent years of interest in the work of women architects. The impact female journalists, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists have had has yet, however, to be fully delineated. Although uh, here you definitely see landmark studies in that regard. And I'd like to also shout out Al, uh, Alice Friedman's Women in the Making of the Modern House. My focus will be upon their activities in support of modern architecture and design and the impact these had upon women's positive reception of it. In this, I followed the approach Catherine Ziff took in her study of the participation of women in the arts and crafts movement in the United States. Penny Spark, another pioneering feminist, a pioneering feminist scholar of interior design, insisted in her 1995 book, As Long As It's Pink, The Sexual Politics of Taste, that modernism was inherently masculinist. But I am exploring how it appealed to women and African Americans with enough money to make consumer choices and the careers that women were able to forge by marketing that appeal. The book I am researching focuses on five case studies. My subjects played a role in the dissemination, adoption, and exportation of modern architecture and design into within and from the United States between 1920 and 1970. The first is Power, who provides an example of women writing for other women. The second is Erickson, Erickson, founded the Stockholm-based design shop Spanx 10. She established the template for other influential design businesses, such as Artec and Knoll, in which women played crucial roles and made I suspect an overlooked contribution to the importation of Scandinavian design into the United States. Between 1963 and 1983, 
Clotheo Woodard Smith ran the country's largest woman owned practice. She built racially integrated urban housing that made money for developers. Ethel Furman designed around 200 houses, churches, and church additions for fellow African Americans in and around Richmond, Virginia, across the course of half a century beginning in the early 1920s. Her career provides a window into their aspirations. For both Furman and Smith, architecture was often an extension of the municipal housekeeping that drew female reformers into the public sphere already in the progressive era, that is the 1890s up through World War I. Gira Sarabai, who you see at the top here, was a co-founder of the Calico Museum and National Institute of Design, whose building she uh, co-designed. These are located in Ahmedabad, India, from which she traveled to the United States to study with Frank Lloyd Wright. Her story highlights the role played by inherited wealth in enabling women to gain the authority necessary to have an impact as institution builders. A conclusion will assess the importance of, these, of the path these women paved for the approaches taken by Denise Scott Brown and Zaha Hadid. Today, I will focus upon Power, Smith, Furman, and Scott Brown, as I have not yet delved into the Erickson and Sarabai archives in Stockholm and Omnibus. This skews the lecture more than I hope will be the case in the finished book towards women who built. Let us now return to power. Beatrice Palomina has, has described mass media as the site in which modern architecture was produced. But although she herself has investigated Playboy, to date, most accounts of the role that journalism played in the emergence and dissemination of modern architecture have focused on journals and books targeted at architects. Important exceptions include Sibel Bozdegan's work on Turkey and Abigail McGowan's on Bombay, now Mumbai. They inspired me to investigate what role shelter magazines played in introducing the international style to women in the United States. Power, who trained as an architect at the Cambridge School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, whose students were all women, edited House Beautiful from 1923 to 1934. House Beautiful sold over 60,000 copies a month at the beginning of Power's editorship, and over 100,000 in 1930 and 1931 in the depths of the Depression. It's largely female readership, composed of subscribers, friends of subscribers, and those who accessed it through their local public libraries was Dutch much larger than the entire architecture profession in the country at the time, and arguably in at least as strong a position to shape taste. A generation later, Betty Friedan drew upon her experience writing for women's magazines in her groundbreaking book, The Feminine Mystique. And a later chapter in the history of House Beautiful focusing on another powerful female editor, Elizabeth Gordon, has recently been written by Monica Pennock. Neither of these accounts prepared me for the purpose of House Beautiful in the power years, which was to educate women to become informed consumers able, able to commission or renovate their homes and to oversee the, their decoration and the maintenance of their gardens. Power also presumed that women would be interested in gentrifying neighborhoods, preserving historic architecture, and staying abreast of new approaches to housing. The purpose of these activities, at least as defined by the editorial content rather than ads, was not an extension of caring for husbands or children. Readers were to find intellectual fulfillment through creating and inhabiting well-designed alternatives to what were understood to be outmoded late Victorian paradigms. While the assistance of professional architects, landscape architects, and decorators was presumed to be key, House Beautiful's female readers were expected to be able to read plans, to want to be informed about modern appliances and mechanical systems, and to thirst for knowledge about the history of architecture and decorative arts in Europe, the United States, and often beyond. Thus empowered, they would make decisions governed by a commitment to simplicity and relative informality appropriate to the descendants of early white settlers of New England and California and be able to take advantage of the new technologies that increasingly replace domestic servants. Simply being fashionable 
was actively discouraged, as was accepting in the many advertisements for silver cutlery and for automobiles, the overt display of wealth. Although the magazine regularly featured mansions alongside urban apartments, Howard was committed to publishing informal and relatively economical houses of two to four bedrooms. Her book, The Smaller American Home of 1927, further buttressed her reputation as an expert in this area. House Beautiful also showed women how they could support themselves economically through such efforts. The work of architects Lois Howe, Verna Cook Salomonsky, and Power's personal partner, Eleanor Raymond, featured regularly in its pages. So did that of Ellen Shipman and other female landscape architects, not to mention women who supported themselves as decorators, such as Raymond's sister, Rachel, who was the client for the house you see on the left, or designed textiles and furnishings. The majority of the magazine's authors were female, some such as Sophie Kerr and Catherine Drinker Bowen were or became well-known writers. Others, including Rose Greeley, the first female architect licensed to practice here in DC, where I am, from which I'm giving this lecture, or Isabel Goodwin, who contributed a series on gardens in the city's Georgetown neighborhood, undoubtedly welcomed the income and publicity such contributions generated. It is in this context that power introduced readers to the international style in content that nonetheless never overpowered the journal's commitment to showcasing the colonial revival and other mainstream styles. That her motivation was not commercial is reinforced by the fact that advertisers took years to follow her lead. Many of the articles that featured either the international style or art deco were written by women. Dorothy Todd, the former editor of the British edition of Vogue, where she had published work by her friend Virginia Woolf, tutored readers on the difference between the two, advocating the work of Le Corbusier, Marcel Breuer, and Walter Gropius over that of Art Deco designers. Issei Gropius, Walter's wife, whom Power met in Berlin when she traveled there with Raymond in 1930, defended standardization. Catherine Morrison, who mostly authored articles on medieval or revivalist British houses introduced readers to the London apartment of Serge Termaya, uh, who would go on to become an in important international style designer on both sides of the Atlantic. And whether informing readers about the European avant-garde, Asian antiques, or contemporary Mexican and Native American craft, House Beautiful authors wrote in an engaging and accessible style. What did modernism offer these women? First and foremost, modern kitchens and bathrooms were convenient. At a time when fewer middle-class households could afford servants than had been the case before World War I, House Beautiful, which did not feature articles on cooking or housework, presumed that those women who could pay for new appliances would appreciate having more time to spend cultivating their minds and promoting civic welfare, as well as caring for their families. This is not the modernism on which architecture magazines focused, but it transformed the daily lives of those who were able to attain it. And it was an aspect of the new that was appreciated without reservation by those with access to it. The reasons for embracing modernism elsewhere in the house were not fundamentally different. Male and female house beautiful authors who advocated the international style frequently equated it with the change in dress that occurred in the 1920s. The, now, I note that here we're looking at a 40 year gap in dress between the 1880s and the 1920s. Think how much smaller the gap in dress of 40 years ago is um, of 1982 from today than the gap you see here. Um, the introduction of bobbed hair, uncorseted waists, and short skirts was one of the most abrupt and transformational revolutions in the entire history of women's dress. And I might note it quickly spread globally. There were women in Calcutta and in Tokyo uh, dressed much as the flappers you see here and, and in Latin America. Um, women who had been physically emancipated in this way were, and also I should add in Tehran and Cairo, were more likely to appreciate other dramatic changes 
even if they were also being constantly encouraged to dismiss mere fads. In an article published in June 1934, after she had resigned as editor, but continued to contribute two articles on average to each issue, Power summarized her position. And I, this is a lengthy quote, and I've, I've cut pieces from it to make it more compact. Our way of living has radically changed. Today, the automobile, the several bathrooms, the telephone, the electric refrigerator, the oil heater, the gas-fired incinerator, the radio, and other mechanical equipment all have to be taken care of. Our early houses, the houses we are still copying, had little to do but provide shelter. And if we would build as sincerely as our forefathers, we will face facts as squarely as they did. The modern house is an effort to meet modern requirements with a sincerity equal to theirs. Indeed, the very essence of the modern house is its straightforwardness in meeting our complicated modern problems. The modern house is therefore restful for it promulgates, or excuse me, it promotes the comfort that comes from ease of operating and lack of fussy meaningless detail. This characteristic appearance of the modern house, which is so largely influenced by the plan, is also due to some extent to the increased use of new materials or to a new use of old ones. This pragmatically, uh, patently pragmatic approach would also serve women who went on to build careers in architecture well. For instance, Clothia Woodard Smith was from her days as a student at the University of Oregon in the early 1930s through to her retirement in 1983, motivated above all by a desire to plan better cities in which people of all incomes and quite quickly also different racial backgrounds would live and prosper together. In April 1975, she gave a lecture at MIT, to which she had been invited near the end of her career in an early stab at inclusiveness. It's only a lunchtime lecture, not one of the main ones, in which she speculated, maybe there is an ongoing difference between theoretical and applied buildings, like the difference between theoretical and applied physics, or even music. I live in the world of applied building. These built places then speak and must speak without words. Perhaps that is why I am afraid of words about buildings. This confirms my friend Sabina Kriebel's analysis, and I quote Kriebel, in contrast to their often more voluble and self-assured male counterparts, women often leave as evidence their actual work and not manifestos, treatises, declarations, credos, or theories. It's up to the work of visual interpretation to suss out, which is tricky to say the least, Kriebel continues, but better to make mistakes than per to perpetuate silence on the subject. Smith, who you see here in front of townhouses and an apartment building that she designed, about which I'll be speaking later in the lecture, gave a lot of talks and wrote a lot of articles, but she typically adopted a self-deprecating tone, professing to have little expertise about the subject at hand and resorting to dictionary definitions to get started. She never situated herself in relation to leading architects or design trends, instead focusing over and over again on how people would inhabit her work. What interests me about her is not the style or quality of her designs, but the strategies she employed to build a successful career and the degree to which her shrewd divergence from professional orthodoxy satisfied those who lived in the housing she created. Beginning in the late 1960s, Smith was dismissive of any focus on her gender. Although in letters from the 1940s, she made clear the degree to which she had endured both harassment and condescension. Her choice not to speak out later in her career was quite probably made in order to preserve the position she had finally attained. She was, however, careful to credit her two full-time Mexican maids, Maria and Soldad, with taking care of the household chores and cooking. She also recognized the importance of maternity leaves and childcare in enabling women to build careers. A well-positioned and supportive husband also helped. In 1940, she married Bromley Smith, a member of the Foreign Service. Their first posting was to Montreal, where Woodard, as she still called herself professionally, immediately got to work organizing an exhibit that laid the foundations for the establishment of the city's Department of Planning. In 1967, President Lyndon Johnson appointed her to the city's all-powerful Commission of Fine Arts, with which she had long tangled 
as one reporter put it, like a wounded tigress. Johnson, who would award her husband this Distinguished Service Medal for his work as an executive secretary of the National Security Council, that's the highest civilian honor um, you can get in the United States, um, or you could at the time as a, as a civil servant, undoubtedly admired her spunk. For what was she fighting? By 1967, it was to pave over Rhode Island Avenue to provide a school serving black children with proper playground facilities. She lost that because the Commission of Fine Arts on which she did not yet sit did not approve. But she got a reputation for being able to get things done already in the 1950s in her work on the urban renewal of Southwest, the city's smallest quadrant, which you see in a contemporary, I mean, from a, a recent uh, aerial view. Like Francesca Amon, who has published astute analyses of Smith's housing, I do not want to claim that Smith's attentiveness to the people who would rent or buy the unit she designed was in any way innately female. A Look magazine profile of her published in 1965 noted, a variety of scales, shapes, textures, and details enriches all her work and exercises the institutional look characteristic of too much new housing. It is this respect for human values rather than any superficial human touch that is one Clothiel Smith so many admirers and her builder clients so many happy tenants. I do speculate, however, that this responsiveness and respect accounted as well for her complex relationship to the urban renewal issues of the day. I also suspect it can be tied back to the position power articulated in 1934. Certainly, Smith received crucial support from other women. Her national reputation was kickstarted by two who wrote sympathetically about her in the pages of Architectural Forum, then the country's leading architecture magazine, for which she had earlier served as South American correspondent. Their focus in both cases was on her contribution to the urban renewal of Southwest DC, where she would go on to design Harbor Square, circled in red on your left, and Capitol Park, cervical in red on your right, just out of uh, view on the right of this uh, aerial view is the United States Capitol. Some of you will recognize the Washington Monument and the Lincoln and Jefferson Memorials. In 1952, Smith and Lewis Justiman were commissioned by the District of Columbia Redevelopment Land Agency to prepare an urban renewal plan for Southwest. They provided a blueprint for developing, redeveloping the area by bridging the railroad that severed it from the rest of the city and developing the waterfront as a public amenity and a magnet for both residents and tourists. They anticipated replacing some of the area's impoverished inhabitants, most of whom were black, and some of its notoriously poor housing with people who could pay higher taxes and would prefer urban living to the suburbs. The redevelopment agency insisted that these people be black as well as white. In 1963, its annual report declared, the agency is proud that since its inception, housing in this area has been available to families and individuals without regard to race, the first new high quality housing in Washington marketed on an open occupancy basis. So although many uh, impoverished blacks were uh, displaced here, in the 1950s and early 60s, a lot of the discussion focused on those middle class and, and indeed elite Blacks who were able to uh, finally live in integrated neighborhoods by moving into new housing, much of it designed by Smith in Southwest. Among the first tenants of Smith's Capitol Park would be where I showed you, where you saw her standing earlier, would be Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court, Robert Weaver, the first black member of the cabinet, he was the, secretary for, the first secretary for housing, and Clifford Alexander, an aide to President Lyndon Johnson, whose daughter Elizabeth delivered the poem at Barack Obama's first inauguration and now heads the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Already in 1952, the gentrification of Southwest was controversial, and it has rightly been criticized ever since as although almost all those who were displaced were provided with better housing in terms of things like toilets, um, uh, indoor plumbing of any kind uh, and, and heat, uh, many never recovered psychologically from the erasure of their neighborhood. Smith herself 
uh, would later accept much of that criticism. But in August 1952, she found a valuable ally for the position she was taking at the time in architectural journalist Mary Mix Foley. Smith probably knew Foley from the five years Foley spent working in public relations at the American Institute of Architects head office in DC, which I show you here. Foley's time at the Octagon overlapped with Smith's efforts in organizing the AIA's exhibit at a meeting uh, in Havana of the Pan American Congress of Architects. She had also been active in the affairs of the Institute in the late 1930s when she spearheaded an exhibit there that criticized continuing to rely on L'Enfant's plan for the city. Writing in Architectural Forum, Foley uh, pub posed a pair of questions. The first, should urban redevelopment attempt to raise the character of an entire area thus bringing economic health and desperately needed tax money back from the suburbs? Or should redevelopment simply clear slums, seeding in perpetuum the best city land to the lowest income families and in all probability creating new slums for the future? End quote. For Foley, as for Smith, who proposed that only a quarter of the housing in the area should be for low income groups with most of the rest for those with middle incomes, the answer at the time was yes to the first and no to the second. In January 1956, less than four years later, Forum returned to the subject of urban renewal in DC. The 23 page feature was the first in the publication to carry Jane Jacobs's byline. Reading between the lines, it is evident that Smith was one of Jacobs sources and that the two women were in complete agreement. Jacobs firmly supported the design of what became the 10th Street Boulevard called for by Justin and Smith, which developer um, William, it's now L'Enfant Plaza, which developer William Zeckendorf and I, architect I.M. Pei appropriated from them without Smith felt giving her sufficient credit. Douglas Haskell, the editor of Architectural Forum agreed. Um, Jacobs complained that Justin and Smith's careful screening of the railroad was about to be marred by the placement of the highway on the wrong side of it, and that cars, cars, cars would entangle the grand plan, the grand vista, the grand architecture. Smith, who frequently complained in the years to come about getting hopelessly lost on her few forays to suburbs she abhorred, must have been delighted. Above all, in language that both foreshadowed her later critique of urban renewal and praised the Smith approach Smith would always take to urban housing, Jacobs defended Smith's designs for Capitol Park, the mixture of apartment blocks and townhouses upon which she, uh, which she began to build in 1958. She was still looking at this point for a developer who would uh, get a mortgage for open housing, open housing, the terminology for housing available to African-Americans. Um, Jacobs approved of the higher density plan Smith and the developers wanted. She worried that if delays continue to hold up area C, which was to be developed by Zeckendorf with buildings by pay, area B, where Capitol Park is, will be out on a bad, bad limb and its flop from that limb will have repercussions on middle income redevelopment across the US. Jacobs singled out for praise as well the inclusion in the Zeckendorf proposal of townhouses that met the street, something very close to what Smith was already planning to build at Capitol Park. The careers of the two women would diverge, however, as Smith increasingly became a Washington insider, working to moderate the damage that urban renewal could cause, while Jacobs became an outspoken activist uh, working to stop it in its tracks. Smith's distinctive approach first attracted national attention through her work on Capitol Park. And I show you uh, Capitol Park at the top here and Chatham Village at the bottom. While many American housers, as Catherine Bauer and others were termed, turned in the decades after World War II to look at Boussier and other European modernists for inspiration, Smith balanced an, ad an admiration uh -huh. for Clarence Stein and Henry Wright, who had briefly been her father-in-law, with lessons learned from recent architecture in South America. At Sunnyside Gardens, where her close friends Lewis and so Sophia Mumford lived in New York City, in suburban Radburn, New Jersey, and in Chatham Village in Pittsburgh, which I show you here, Stein and Wright emphasized low rise housing planned around communal green spaces, which in Capitol Park were landscaped by Dan Kiley. Parking was grouped around the periphery of each block. The complex was bounded, however, by nine-story apartment slabs. These were clad in tile and brick, which Smith used to harmonize with the city's many brick neighborhoods. 
Her choice of them also, however, reflected her experience of modern architecture in South America, with, with which she had become familiar long before she traveled to Europe. During World War II, her husband was posted in La Paz, Bolivia. She taught in the university there and wrote for the local newspaper before embarking on a tour of the continent funded by a Guggenheim grant. She returned to South America a decade later when she designed the United States Embassy in Paraguay. Her approach to tropical architecture and Washington summers can feel tropical, although the Capitol apartment, uh, Park apartment buildings featured full air conditioning, was clearly derived from her experience in South America. Brick and tile screens and shallow vaults were widely publicized features of modern architecture throughout that Latin America. The results pleased another influential female journalist. In January 1965, Cosmopolitan Magazine, in what must have been one of the last issues in decades not to be edited by Helen Gurley Brown, included an article by none other than Friedan, extolling Smith as an exemplary working woman in Capitol Park as a blueprint for future city living that may replace the dream house which has barred so many young mothers from full participation in professions or education or the complex sciences that are centered in cities. Smith and Friedan had probably met some months earlier at a White House reception for female supporters of Johnson's reelection campaign. Uh, Smith was a Republic, registered Republican of the sort of the Eisenhower variety, but strongly backed Johnson, with whom her husband had a very good working relationship, as we've already seen. In Capitol Park, hosted by the glamorous Adele Logan Alexander, the leader of this. Uh, 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 of the initiative, she met with half a dozen mothers who had organized cooperative daycare. Later that year, Ebony Magazine would name Alexander, who designed her own clothes and had majored in architectural studies at Radcliffe, one of the best dressed African American women of the year. Alexander became an eminent scholar of African American history. I've already mentioned her husband Clifford and daughter Elizabeth. Smith, who had struggled to find appropriate care for her own two children, must have approved. From 1952 through the 1960s, Smith was a key figure in the redevelopment of Southwest. For the rest of her career, she was, as we have seen, influential in architecture and planning circles in DC, and to some extent also on the national stage, although more with policymakers and real estate developers than fellow architects. Working in her characteristically applied fashion, she was in some ways a consummate insider and in others remained staunchly removed from the mainstream. Nowhere was this truer than in her attentiveness to and indeed respect for consumer demand. This also affected her approach to low-income housing rather than the market rate complexes now on your screen. Her notes in 1975, note the date again at the end of her career and after feminist architectural activism had begun to garner her such in invitations, um, for a presentation at Harvard's Graduate School of Design read, non-low income people have skills and education and food and cars, et cetera. And it's okay for poor people to aspire to getting these. There are few low income products except housing defined, regulated, and budgeted. You are not supposed to have a choice or aspire to the Cadillac of places to live. If you watch the TV ads, it doesn't take long to figure out that the poor are sold everything but a fine place to live. And the settings for these ads from kitchen floor cleaners to sherry are in rooms and gardens that they can't aspire to. Maybe if architects practiced in the cities where they live and the people they design for are people they know, and maybe if government could find a way to make money available to small groups of people and would trust them to use it well, maybe this would provide the setting for creative work, for experiments in building fine places to live that give everyone a sense of place and a sense of identity. Smith's own track record was not perfect. In addition to the controversy over displacement that rightly dogged Southwest, LeClay Town, a racially integrated mixed income Townhouse development she designed in St. Louis lasted only 30 years. Her apartment complexes in Brookline, Massachusetts, New Haven, Connecticut, Southwest, and the townhouses you see here in Reston, Virginia remain, however, appreciated by their inhabitants and are increasingly also drawing the attention of fans of mid-century modernism. And uh, both Southwest and Reston were written up in Ebony Magazine as places 
for aspiring uh, Black uh, uh, Americans to live in integrated circumstances. Thank you, Diane Harris, Christina Wilson, and others, the role of race in mid-century housing in the United States is finally a, a, attracting the attention it deserves. Power presumed that her readers were white, although Jacqueline Taylor has demonstrated that Amaza Lee Meredith consulted a similar publication, The American Home, before building Azarus South for her partner Edna Colson and herself on the campus of Virginia State University, the historically black institution whose fine arts program she founded. Power published a house by Paul Williams, who was black, without alluding to the architect's race, of which she may not even have been aware. Ethel Furman and her black clients would, however, certainly have known of Williams, who was featured several times in the 1950s in the pages of Ebony and who won the NAACP's prestigious Spring Iron Medal in 1953. Furman's surviving archive is modest, consisting mostly of drawings for about two dozen post-war commissions, many of them small extensions to Baptist churches in rural Virginia. I, uh, I'm still working on Furman. I'm not very far along yet. She was the daughter of Madison Bailey, a licensed contractor who in 1910 built the house in Richmond's Churchill neighborhood where Furman lived for most of the rest of her life. She trained as a draftsperson in New York in the early 1920s. Many years later in 1946, she earned an associate degree from the Chicago Technical College. That year, the local black paper reported that, quote, she has been preparing blueprints for homes and churches for the past 15 years. Now her work has been broadened to include steel and concrete structures and plans for hotels and department stores. Details, unfortunately, of these remain to be traced and it's not clear that these ambitions were real, fully realized. Her papers in the Library um, of Virginia include drawings, however, for only a fraction of the building she designed. Many of these have probably been destroyed, sometimes through urban renewal and sometimes as churches grew more prosperous and expanded. Ample evidence exists, however, of her standing in the community and her commitment to its welfare. For instance, um, oops, can't believe, yeah, there we are. It's a mistake I've made in this twice because the slide's in the wrong order. I thought I would have fixed it by now. Uh, for instance, Furman was featured in 1945 and again in 1949 in the Times Dispatch, the city's largest newspaper, speaking out in favor of retaining the Gothic Revival City Hall at a time when white male architects and other cultural leaders would have preferred to replace it with something more modern. It is possible that she recognized in its use of rusticated stone and medieval details an unusual choice of material and style in Virginia a resemblance to the building's Buffalo architect John Coxhead had built for Virginia Union University, Richmond's historically black institution of higher education. Furman was also celebrated for her civic activism, although I am still teasing out the details of her involvement with charities and politics. She campaigned to get Richmond's second segregated high school placed in her Churchill neighborhood and was involved in the Democratic Party running unsuccessfully in 1953 for a spot on the civic commu committee. This at a time when many African-Americans throughout the South could not vote. She certainly did. A decade later, she spoke at an event on housing sponsored by the local NAACP. She was also a stalwart of fundraising campaigns for the fight against polio. Now, wait a minute, I've got my slides getting mixed up order. There we are. Uh, Furman originally designed houses built by her father's firm. These included the house in which Douglas Wilder, the country's first African-American to be elected a governor, was raised. Her designs evolved over time to suit changing tastes. These, those for which drawings survive, including for six members of the Sneed family, are, as you see here, quite con um, conventional suburban houses of the era, in this case, the late 1960s. So uh, very at the end, very end of her career. For their inhabitants, they undoubtedly represented an immense step forward, finally giving these middle-class families access to the aspirations described by Smith. Harris and uh, Wilson have argued for the uh, implicit whiteness of such architecture, but I am not convinced that black taste lagged behind or was different from that of whites in any significant way, except as Margaret Ruth Little has shown, for an aversion to styles that adopted forms associated with the domestic architecture of enslavers. Certainly Ebony recent, regularly featured the more glamorous, but otherwise entirely conventional homes 
inhabited by the country's black elite. Moreover, by the 1960s, photographs of modern office buildings served in its pages as evidence of economic and social progress in the capital cities of newly independent African states, such as Ghana and Nigeria, as well as in the United States. Now let's go to the right one. Yeah, here we are. Berman's building activities were not confined to domestic architecture. She was a lifelong member of Fourth Baptist Church, which you see at the bottom of your screen, and designed churches and church extensions for a number of Black Baptist congregations in the Richmond area. Fourth Baptist, which was close to her home, was founded in 1859 by people who were still enslaved. Its present sanctuary was erected in 1884. In 1964, she added a wing containing offices and classrooms. Perhaps her most prestigious commission, this is the only design of hers I have found that indicates an interest in the international style. I am hoping to locate news accounts of the building that will provide more insight into how it was seen at the time, particularly in the African American community. I am especially curious about whether school buildings in Richmond, such as the new John Marshall High, which admitted its first three black students in 1961, the year it opened, served as a model. I would also like to know more about the degree to which Furman may have been consciously making available to a black constituency a style associated with places to which they were campaigning for greater access. And here on the left, you see her drawing for that building. Furman's career suggests uh, an adaptability as regards style that like Smith is not entirely out of place with the position outlined by power in 1934. The careers of these three women demonstrate that, like teaching, nursing, and librarianship, the supposed gender appropriateness of an engagement with architecture and design enabled women to contribute to the shaping of the built environment in ways that have been insufficiently acknowledged. To date, the bulk of the scholarship on women architects and designers of this era addresses those like Eileen Gray, Lily Reich, Minette De Silva, and Lena Bobardi, who are more obviously aligned with the upper echelons of the design profession. There are also uh, parallels with Scott Brown's theoretical position. Her close observation of the vernacular can be seen in the 1976 exhibition, Signs of Life, Symbols in the, Amer of, in the American City at Washington's Renwick Gallery, on which she collaborated with Robert Venturi and Stephen Eisenhower. The labels argue that people are more interested in representing their ideals and aspirations through architecture than they are in noticing how well a building expresses its st structure and function. This argument was buttressed by thoughtful analyses of what the critic Ada Louise Huxtable writing in the New York Times termed a revealing picture of today's aesthetic standards that has everything to do with what is and little to do with what anyone thinks should be. Scott Brown takes the ordinary seriously and decodes the messages it communicates to those far removed from architectural culture. Some of the skills this required undoubtedly came from being an outsider. She was born and grew, grew up in, uh, she was born in, in, in what's now Zambia and grew up in, in Johannesburg, South Africa, who did not take row houses like these nor the ways in which their interiors were decorated for granted. It also indicated an almost uncanny ability to understand how women without either her highly tuned sense of irony or her top drawer professional training, used their culturally sanctioned role in choosing their family's interior decor. Scott Brown respected their choices, acknowledging that they furnished their homes to say something about who they were and what they valued. The sympathetic Huxtable concluded, this is the kind of show that changes the way you look at the world. Scott Brown's experience growing up in an increasingly racially divided Johannesburg left her with a respect for working and middle-class taste, which was unusual at a time when advocates of modern architecture tended to espouse it as the expression of the power of the masses, but use it to define their own sophistication. She has written that African folk pop was an inspiration for our study of roadside America. This Africa as documented in the photographs at the bottom left and on the right by Constance Stewart Larrabee, was far removed from the African architecture fawned over in the 1950s and 60s by Aldo Van Eyck and Bernard Rudowski that you see at the top left. These two European men turned to Africa and what they believed to be other primitive cultures. And I, I do not myself countenance that term primitive for this architecture for a supposed authenticity that they thought 
the Industrial Revolution, and very specifically its commercialism, rather than its industry and engineering, had destroyed. Scott Brown, on the other hand, was interested in the modernity of Black Africans and understood that they had the same right to fashionable clothes and to urban space as she did. Having accepted this, she could also allow that blue collar Americans, whether or not their taste agreed with her own, should not be dismissed out of hand with an air of cultural superiority. I am just beginning this project uh, and just beginning to identify the similarities and approach that may tie Power, Smith, Furman, and Scott Brown together and the degree to which these were conditioned by their gender. What will take me more time to discern is the extent to which the socialization of the relatively exceptional figures that are my subjects can be linked to middle-class and wealthy women's activities as consumers and the degree to which these in turn drove stylistic and other changes in architecture and design between 1920 and 1970. Erickson and Sarabai are likely to be useful in this regard. I hope to generate scholarship in support of a diverse profession and inform a diverse public that can hold the profession accountable to building for them. I welcome your questions and comments as I contribute to charting a path along which I hope many of us will travel together. Thank you. And I will stop. So I'm glad to take questions and continue to the discussion or start the discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> I May I uh, just, uh, as everybody's thinking, may I um, start? Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for this amazing uh, lecture. It's a tour de force uh, uh, journey where we are introduced to many of these figures we don't know about. Uh, a few of them we do. Um, uh, uh, and it's really interesting to see, uh, for example, how Smith and um, uh, uh, Jane Jacobs' career uh, merge and <laughs> diverge. Uh, uh, I I I want to ask about this concept of applied modernism, uh, which is so interesting. Is is that a, a term Smith uses just to clarify, or uh, is is it a term you're elaborating, conceptualizing, because it has so much potential for all these variations of modernism uh, that existed even within Europe that don't necessarily enter history books, uh, but that make the story so much richer and interesting. So that's a term that that's Smith term developed, developed to describe herself. Um, and I think it's incredibly useful. And I think I have to do a lot more work unpacking it because I think there's a lot of that modernism that is not specifically theoretical. It's out there um, partly to be the architecture of the moment, partly because it's not very expensive, partly because of change in materials. And I think a lot more could be said about it. She is very much aware of what we would consider the cutting edge modernism of her, of her day. She organized exhibitions uh, in Havana and Moscow on behalf of the AIA that showed all the people you would expect. And she knew a lot of them personally, although not very well in most cases, she was very close to, to Lewis Mumford, uh, Lewis and Sophia Mumford. Um, she, but she interacted with them. She, she read the magazine. She knew what their work looked like, um, but she didn't always follow in their footsteps. And interestingly enough, um, her work is held up as a place to live better than many of those people. And um, of course, it was subsidized middle income housing. It was not projects, um, but it's fared particularly well. And I find it interesting that she was able to hit a sweet spot that was really targeted more at the people who would live in it and by extension at developers, but really at the people who would live in it, then at the profession. And she speaks sometimes very frankly about that already in the 1960s, uh, the importance of building 
for consumers and for the market. And of course, not everybody can afford to be part of the market. Uh, poor people were not part of the market. And she was quite aware of the degree to which Black Washingtonians and Blacks across the country were not able to participate in consumer choice and were given whatever the profession deemed um, in co uh, and the government deemed appropriate. Um, so I think a lot more could be done with that term. There are a lot of different terms that have emerged in the last few decades to describe the varieties of modernism. When I was working on my dissertation on Mendelssohn, I kept thinking about multiple modernisms because he was the cutting edge for many people in the 1920s of modern architecture and isn't remembered that way today. Um, I think modern mm -hmm. architecture was quite diverse and that's something um, that I hope to tease out a bit more in this project. The, cons the women's consumer side of modern architecture um, is a lot of what the profession likes to disrespect, but it's a lot of what got built. And I think we have to understand why it got built and what people liked about it as compared to what we're taught to like about the work of, of other people of the period. For instance, um, Lou Kahn built uh, Mill Creek Houses in this period in Philadelphia as a, as a low income project, but the same, same combination of townhouses and high rises. And those are not remembered as well. The high rises have come down and the low income projects, which got a lot more architectural press than anything that Smith did except for Capitol Park are, have not been considered cherished places to live. Um, I mean, already in the 1980s, they weren't. And so, um, so the, di the divergence between what the profession admires and what people who live in things want is, is important. And I think if we think about what people who live in things want, when we talk about residential architecture, we're talking a lot about women having in the middle classes and wealthy women having a great say in these discussions. Sometimes also for office buildings. I mean, Phyllis Lambert, uh, uh, certainly uh, with the Seagram building, but that's that's less often. And uh, you're making a call uh, for um, architecture researchers to look at not only um, professional magazines, but um, uh, these uh, mass mediated popular magazines uh, like House Beautiful and uh, and Ebony, uh, which has been so important for middle class uh, black life uh, and consumption. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I'm wondering um, um, uh, if you could elaborate on that, uh, for example, why uh, you're identifying that scholars have not looked at these uh, popular uh, press and uh, uh, the role of woman. Why, why is that? Uh, if you could elaborate on it. Yes, I, um, early in my career, I learned a lot from looking at newspapers and I've written about that already um, mm -hmm. in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. I think that we tend, first of all, architecture journals are easy for architectural historians to find. The Avery Index tells us where everything is after these journals start in the middle of the 19th century. Um, good architecture school libraries often have a lot of them, and, um, and if yours doesn't have it, you can travel to the better architecture school that does. McGill, you probably have complete runs of all the major North American journals and, some, and many of the European ones as well. And um, so that's easy. And it tells you what the profession was looking at. It's not always the story of the top famous architects. Um, Architectural record in the United States is often sort of mainstream profession as opposed to forum or progressive architecture, which were the, the elite and published the cutting edge stuff more often. Um, but uh, if you wanna get be beyond the architecture profession to understand how people were being told to look at their built environment, then you have to get to the rest of this. And when I found, when I gave this talk in December, I didn't yet have the, the figures for uh, the sales for House Beautiful. Uh, a very helpful librarian at the Library of Congress found those for me. Well, <laughs> they're huge. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. 
the main women's magazines in the United States had figures that were 10 times that. The, uh, for most of the 20th century, the most read periodicals in the United States, except for Time Magazine and, and Life Magazine were women's were magazines uh, targeted at women. They had a lot about architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright published in, um, uh, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's not. He published in uh, the top women's magazine of that period. I think it's still going, uh, rather than in the architectural press in early in his career in order to get 10 times or 100, yeah, not 10, or 10 times or 20 times more readers than he would have if he had been in record. And um, I think we have, if we want to think about what the architectural community thought about itself, the architecture magazines are the place to go. If we want to think about what the larger society of those people who could afford these magazines knew, then we have to go to these magazines. And so what we find is that um, 100,000 people knew about the international style a year before the show in New York. Um, many more people were reading House Beautiful than went to that exhibition. Uh, it's a slightly different set of people, but I've always argued that the importance of that exhibition has been much exaggerated and really it only achieves its canonical status late in the 1940s when Hitchcock and Johnson are using that to further their career. Having gone through the architecture magazines of the 30s, I can tell you it has next to no impact in them. Um, and that, that so I, I did that work already in the 90s. Um, so I was, I was pleasantly surprised to find out um, how House Beautiful worked. Now, other shelter magazines of the period in the United States were not as involved in this as House Beautiful. It was the one that was edited by a woman. It was the one um, that focused on the work of women, the writing of women. It was quite exceptional. Many of the women in this circle um, were lesbians, not all of them uh, by any means, but there was a tight social circle in Boston of women who'd studied at the Cambridge School of Architecture and were committed to other women and to their careers. Uh, but it had a real influence and the sales figures uh, are just enormous. And we know with magazines like this, not everybody who buys this is going to build a house. A lot of this is aspirational. How many of you have read Vogue magazine as opposed to spend $3,000 on some drop dead ball gown? Um, but, but people did read it and people did see what the different trends and possibilities were and people were educated in architectural history um, and design history through it. And also in trends in historic preservation, uh, which we know is disproportionately women were involved in it um, mm -hmm. throughout at least the first six decades of the 20th century in the United States, it's largely women led. Um, there's a lot about gentrification already in here, uh, earlier than uh, most scholarship has that starting in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember that if you had enough money, these women had some real agency. And I think the architectural profession, which has worked hard in the 20th century in the United States and Johnson particularly hard to shut women out and Johnson being particularly difficult to Denise Scott Brown and trying to shut her down and out uh, has not wanted to admit that kind of agency. We won't haven't um, and has worked hard to be dismissive of it. And it's consumerism is not the ideal kind of agency to have. Better to have you know lots of other things going on. But it was what was available, and it was only of course available to women who had a certain amount of money. And we have to recognize that. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't available at all to Blacks. There were some exceptions, not many, but they existed. And in, in Meredith and, and Furman, we find two women living within an hour's drive of each other who are definite exceptions. And Meredith went to uh, Teachers College at Columbia and went to the Museum of Modern Art and saw the International Style Exhibition. And, a lot of other exhibitions. I mean, we know what she had seen, but she doesn't actually build like Le Cabousier. She builds more like what she's seen in, in, in the magazines of the 1930s that are focused on women. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up for questions. I know we have uh, many colleagues in the audience, uh, as well as students, but colleagues who specialize <laughs> um, <clears throat> on women's or who's done pioneering work on women's contributions. Let me check the chat. I think one of the struggles is to not celebrate consumerism but to understand the ways that it could be used to have an impact. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Please, Margaret. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your... Uh... Thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a question um, more about the, could you tell us a bit more about the people writing and sharing this um, architectural history with the readers of Home Magazine? You mentioned Frieden was one of the writers, like what was sort of the background? Were they um, historians? Were they feminist writers or, just sort of general writers tasked to to talk about this. I'm just sort of curious about that. Well, Frida is an interesting exception because she's somebody who um, supports herself in the 1950s, writing for the big general interest magazines, women's magazines, and then turns on them in the feminine mystique. And actually, scholars have shown that a lot of what she says about them in the, in, the, in the feminine mystique is not entirely true, that if you go back and read those general interest magazines from the 50s, they're more supportive of women having careers in particular than she describes. Um, and I haven't gone back to do that review, but I have read that critique of her scholarship. Um, at Jacobs, it, it, so writing for magazines did not require you to have the same degree of education. Uh, so Jacobs uh, it writes for labor magazines, then she writes for Architectural Forum, then she goes to a conference at Harvard in 1956 and says basically what she said in the article in Washington, and Lewis Mumford, who she later really turns on, and who's a good friend of Smith's, gives her a lot of support and she gets a grant to, to write uh, what becomes the death and life of Amer great American cities. So then she is sort of described as an outsider, this housewife who doesn't know what she's writing about, but she's not an outsider. She's not um, simply a housewife. She's been a journalist for years and she's been writing for Architectural Forum for quite a long time. And she's very well networked in New York in the architecture world. And she knows, and she's traveled around the country writing about these, uh, these um, urban planning projects. And she knows what she's talking about. She also turns out to be incredibly successful activist, um, first in New York and then in Toronto. Um, the people, the women writing for House Beautiful vary. Uh, some of them have expertise in uh, landscape architecture. Some of them have architecture degrees, often from um, the Cambridge School. Some of them, uh, Catherine Drinker Bowen starts as a faculty wife, probably trying to make some money on the side, writing for House Beautiful and becomes one of the most important mid-century American uh, biographers. She writes books that win prizes and sell hundreds of thousands of copies and uh, supports herself that way. Um, a, a, you know, people are getting paid to write and they're supporting themselves by writing about things they feel they know about, but which they don't, have necessarily have degrees in. And there's a huge swath of advice literature that is written by and for women in this period, uh, which is being reviewed. The books being reviewed in House Beautiful are often advice literature by women. Dorothy Todd uh, was a lesbian friend of Virginia Woolf's who when Woolf is making money, goes out and helps her buy the appropriate clothes for her photo shoots and publishes her work in Vogue magazine. Um, so she's working for a fashion magazine, but she's a good friend of Virginia Woolf's. Um, so, so these, these are, and writing had been a way for women to support themselves throughout the 19th century, well-educated women support could sometimes, 
support themselves that way. And in the 19th century, editing these journals for women was a way of women to support themselves. Of course, the first architectural critic in the United States was um, uh, Mariana Van Rensselaer, uh, a woman, before there were any men doing that. Um, and so it's, uh, and the first architecture, the first history of architecture published in the United States was published in, 19, in 1848 by Louisa Tuthill and was a global survey of architecture. Um, so women had been in this space for a long time, but um, I mean, I hadn't heard of Louisa Tuthill until just a couple of years ago. Um, and so, you know, we all know Bannister Fletcher, but here's a more inclusive history being written by a woman who has no training whatsoever, but she's hanging out in the library, the best one of the best architecture libraries in the United States in New Haven at the time and writes a book to support herself. She's a widow and she's well-educated and this is how she makes money. Um, and I think these are often uh, unmarried women or widows um, supporting themselves with journalists. A quarter of the journalists in the United States at the, around 1900 were female. So journalism was a space for women. And, um, and so I think we haven't thought enough about women readers. We know that most users of public libraries in the 19th century in the United States were women. I'm sure that's true in Canada as well, or children. Um, and so we haven't thought as hard as we can about this because it's displacing power. And there are two issues. It's displacing power to women, but it's also not critical in terms of class because these are almost always middle-class or elite women. So it doesn't displace it where we really want, you know, down the economic ladder, uh, because those women are not always literate, don't have time, don't always have the education to write, the time to write, the connections to write. It's a different, a different world. Uh, but these women do, and and they have readers. Um, yes, um, go ahead. Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for a great lecture. Um, there's so many um, connections with Canada all over the place. But um, uh, one question I would have is when when Peta Tancred and I had a chance to interview Canadian women architects, um, so many of them and their clients told us that they chose they chose women architects because, in fact, they had to really design the building and then the women just drew them up. <laughs> so, um, that women architects, at least in the post World War II period, were really almost seen, many of them, and including Marjorie Hill, Canada's uh, first woman architect, um, were really seen in this way of being a kind of vessel for men's ideas. And uh, Hill's drawings look so much like so many of the drawings you showed today. So I wonder if you found any of that. Uh, you wouldn't find it in the women's magazines. <laughs> you know, men's magazines. <laughs> I would. I, I haven't found it, and that's really interesting because um, Smith clearly. Um, I mean, she ran a big office, and not everything that was produced out of her office was completely drawn by her, and she had a lot of men in that office. Uh, but um, but that office produced the work. She didn't. The, nobody else designed it. Furman, um, I'm sh quite sure in some cases people said, oh, I like this house or I've seen something in a magazine or on TV. Furman's job was to be the professional drafts person in, in some of those houses are not terribly original or unique, um, who provided the documents that, and explained to you, is this really what you want? And then gave it to the contractor. Her father had been a contractor. Um, but famously, she sometimes had to, have men sign the drawings to get the stuff built. Um, she's described in the African-American press in the 30s as a licensed architect, but by the 50s, she's described in the Richmond papers as a licensed drafts, uh, a draft, drafts person. Uh, because it's not clear to me whether she was licensed in the 30s, but it's clear to me that by the 50s, she couldn't be licensed because she didn't have the right training. Um, so she operates on this and, and, and and people in Richmond have told me that somebody else must have had to sign the drawings for Fourth Street Baptist Church because that was big enough commission that uh, she couldn't have gotten away with it as somebody who wasn't an architect, whereas for the houses, it didn't make any difference. 
Um, so that's, that's not something I'd heard before. Um, and I don't, I mean, one of the things in the United States, as you know, is that there were, there were, there was probably more going on in the twenties at some level than there was in the fifties. And, um, uh, but people like uh, Liza Sh uh, Shoy Close in Minnesota, they, they were known for listening to their clients, mm -hmm. but, and I, and Smith was known not for, I mean, she was building for an anonymous group often. She didn't, she did single family houses, but she didn't like them. She said they took way too much time. You had to listen way too much to your client. <laughs> uh, so she thought the clients all needed psychiatrists instead of architects. Um, so, but I think there's certainly cases where, where women architects were thought to be better listeners yeah. and thought to be people you had more authority in relationship to. Yes. Um, Smith, who was a hard drinking, hard smoking, and, and, and could use a lot of foul language when necessary, uh, wasn't any kind of pushover, although she was quite short. Um, and may have looked very demure and ladylike, uh, but everybody agreed that she could not be pushed around. Um, but in other cases, of course, um, the issue of who has authority. I have a friend um, from high school, Peter Bentel, whose mother studied at MIT, where she met his father and they had a practice together. And um, of course, every time they walked into a meeting, everyone assumed that Peter's father was the architect and that his mother was there as the secretary. And as often as not, she had designed things and he was there to be the note taker. And in the 60s and 70s, um, people simply didn't believe that. I suspect they didn't believe it in the 80s and 90s from the stories I know. Um, but uh, so I think um, I, I, getting credit for what you do uh, when you're a part of a disrespected minority uh, is difficult. Um, interesting in Furman's case, uh, she was completely beloved in her community and clearly known and respected in white Richmond as well. And um, that she's interviewed as an architect in the newspapers in the 40s twice to weigh in against majority opinion. Um, she's not taken completely seriously, but on the other hand, she's not identified as being black. Uh, the story is that here is a woman architect who's weighing in and uh, taking the other side. Um, she, relatively soon after her death, about six years, six or eight years later, there was a playground dedicated in her honor. And she's, you know, every Richmond school kid learns about her. Um, she, but I don't think she was seen as threatening either. She was a, a church lady, uh, a fundraiser. Um, she wasn't, um, uh, she wasn't um, the most militant you know, that was a younger generation who did sit-ins and things. Um, and so people across racial lines could deal with her, although I don't think they voted for her across racial lines, but she voted, uh, which itself was a challenge. You had to pay a poll tax in 1953 to vote and she's active in the Democratic Party um, and in trying to get change within the Democratic Party. So. Well, the numbers are just so much smaller in Canada for women architects and everything happened a generation later and they really came from Eastern Europe, the, um, the sort of, so it's, it's really a different Well, story. and Close came from Eastern Europe. She had grown up in Vienna in an Adolf Loos house where her father had been a major person in housing policy in Vienna. So then um, smartly as a Jewish a uh, young Jewish woman in Vienna in the early 1930s, her family ships her off to MIT and she never, she doesn't go home again for years. Um, and that saves her life and um, gives her the credentials. But MIT of course was the er place for women to study. It, it had a, a, a number of women in the, in the late 19th century, but I was invited there not so many years ago to give a lecture on women in architecture and there, the students in the room had never heard of any of the women who had studied there. And if they, of course, you know, we taught them all at Berkeley, but they weren't part of the curriculum at MIT. Since then, I think they've improved a bit, but 
This was only 2017, <laughs> so it's not that long ago. And the Cambridge School was undoubtedly uh, spun off at a time when MIT probably wanted to have fewer women, but, but it's not coincidental that Close and Bentel both went to MIT. Um, I th it had more, more women. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Great to see you, even virtually. <laughs> um, I was wondering, because you mentioned about contemporary awareness, um, and you started your talk with the um, current um, uh, uh, situation, uh, women, uh, the number of women have increased in schools, but they're dropping out of the profession. You started uh, mentioning that. And uh, there was a re the students in the class write uh, response questions, and there was one response uh, which I guess I get every year in different ways. Why are we reading about this? Because we have equality now. <laughs> and uh, there's a strong perception, um, it seems That's, uh, that- I'll speak to that. So in, in 1985, I headed off to do my PhD and I'd been working for two years on researching women and the patronage of public library buildings in. 19th century Massachusetts. And I had thought that my dissertation would be on women as patrons of architecture in 19th century New England. And I spent the summer in Germany and I came back and I thought a much more political topic would be to work on Eric Mendelssohn, a Jew German Jewish architect who had then worked um, in, in Mandate Palestine and in the United States where he had pretty much invented the modernist synagogue. And that in 1985, you could think that it was more political to work on Mendelssohn than on women, because after all, there were all these feminists working. Alice Friedman, uh, Dolores Hayden, Gwendolyn Wright, uh, Mary McLeod. I thought there was no room for me in that company, you know, whereas with Mendelssohn, I could do something new and fresh. Already 50% of the women studying architecture at Penn when I was studying, or 50% of the people studying architecture at Penn when I was studying art history were women. We thought we made it. 40 years later, almost, the sense that we've made it, I've watched as many of my most talented female students have abandoned the profession and the statistics are that half the women I've taught have left. And that is incredibly frustrating. And I have uh, spoken out about sexual harassment on two campuses where I've taught. I'm better known in Ireland for that than I am for anything I've ever published. And <laughs> I've had a difficult uh, relationship with some of my colleagues um, around these issues. And I have seen that most of the men with whom I teach um, at three different universities have been willing to look the other way. And I have seen what this has done to the careers of some of the, the brightest people I've ever known um, have been damaged or destroyed by this. And I would like, I, if you told me when I was 25 that this issue would continue to matter now, I wouldn't have believed you. And I wish I didn't have to believe myself. And also, if you look at the competitor books to mine and you see how many women are listed in the index, these are written by men who do not want women in the profession. Their students have told me that repeatedly. And you can see it in the indices. And they are not looking for women. They are not, the scholarship has been out there since Dolores Hayden wrote Seven American Utopias at the end of the 1970s. It is not present in the other survey books at all. And it is not present because the men writing those books don't want it to be present. They want the authority of architects. They will let in a few women more now than they used to into those books uh, who have all done the right modernist things, but they won't let in the women who haven't done the right modernist things. And, and they will say nasty things in lectures and at dinner parties around those women if they know anything about them anyway. And it's immensely frustrating. Um, I'm now living down the street from the bar where I used to get my il drink illegally. Um, you know, I'm not a young person anymore. I've gone gray. I don't have to show my ID there. Um, 
I'm 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 61. And so I have seen I was one of those people, one of those women, but people as well, uh, men and people of whatever uh, gender identification they want, who who in when I was young thought that this issue was taken care of and we had equality. And I learned the hard way, the very hard way, very hard way. that that yes. I don't, that my students don't and that many of the people with whom I teach are willing to collaborate in a situation that denies equality. And so um, that's the genesis of this project. Um, I mean, I spent most of my career working on, on our, the relationship between architecture and politics, but in the last, oh, I don't know, six or eight years, I've increasingly returned to gender, uh, which is, where I started and um, it's probably where I'll finish. I probably do have one good book on Luke Kahn left in me, but um, this is somebody who hit up on a number of women. Uh, Denise Scott Brown has memories of that. Although if you said no, he knew no, no, he didn't, he wasn't a rapist. He just, he, he, he'd try it. Uh, a chancer and a charming chancer. Um, but I can't, I had to write this book before I could write the Luke Kahn book. So I hope that equality is what you will experience. I really hope that that's what you will have. It's what you deserve. <laughs> um, and equality across every kind of racial, gender, and class lines is what everybody deserves. And uh, But it's not what my generation of women experienced uniformly. Some bit did. And it's not what my students have experienced uniformly. Some did, but not all. Well, this uh, thanks so much uh, for sharing these experiences. This brings us to the politics of writing architectural history, the subjects we choose to write about. Uh, it shows our politics, whereas uh, we are not accustomed to think about these choices as uh, political moves. Uh, you know, we are. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know what do you think, I may, uh, obviously you have been very conscious in your choices as well, but um, it's not necessarily embedded in our discourse, uh, you know, that what we are doing is political as architectural historians. Yeah, well, you and I have worked in the school to try and enhance that. So I like to think that we've made some progress, but as Kathleen has said, it's far from equitable. Well, in that context, I have to say, I transferred from working on gender to working on to Barbara Miller Lane, who wrote the book on architecture and politics. Yeah. So I had in that um, a very, very uh, inspirational woman to teach me how to do that. Um, yes, those role models are really important. Absolutely. I'm sure you've been one for many, many people. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time, but uh, hopefully this is the beginning of further conversations. And uh, we appreciate so much for sharing your uh, forthcoming work uh, uh, with us. And it's been uh, eye opening. Thank you so much. I'm just sorry I couldn't see you in person. And all the best. <laughs> Bye.